I would now like to invite my colleagues from ITU, Bilal, to give you just a brief overview on ITU activities on intelligent transport systems. Bilal, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Walter. I'd also like to invite uh, my colleague, uh, Sergio Bonomo from ITU, from the Radio Bureau to join me. We're gonna do a tag team on this uh, quick update on the standards work uh, that's uh, underway in, uh, in ITU uh, with respect to um, intelligent transportation systems. Um, Great. Thank you very much, uh, Gifty. So, um, for the newcomers to ITU, there are three sectors in the ITU. One is the radio sector, the other is the standardization sector. Uh, Sergio works in the radio sector, I work in the standardization sector, and we have a third sector, the development sector, that works with the developing countries to enable deployment of new telecommunication technologies. Uh, so the, when we talk about ITU, we're not talking about Sergio and I as staffers, we're really talking about the whole world community that includes the governments, the private sector, and the academia. These are the experts that come to our meetings to develop international standards, to agree on new um, frequencies, satellite orbits, as well as new policies and regulation when it comes to telecommunications. And in a way, it's a unique platform because uh, it is the only UN organization that is open to the private sector and to academia. So we have an ecosystem that has fully inclusive of both private public and academic institutions. Walter says, no, perhaps UNEC is also uh, open uh, to uh, uh, private sector, government, and academia. Very good. So that's why we're partnering on this uh, topic today. Um, so what we'll do in the next 20 minutes or so, we're not going to take a lot of your time, but uh, since we're talking about future network car, and we have been holding this, as Mr. Zhao mentioned, th since 2005, and part of it is really to enable the dialogue between the ICT sector and automotive sector, and to come up with uh, some concrete deliverables and milestones, as Ms. Olga, Her Excellency, mentioned today, some of the uh, standards or regulations are based on ITU standards when it comes to uh, e-call and, and some of the um, uh, in-car communication uh, uh, that, that is enacted uh, on a global level. So we need to show you a bit how it goes behind the scenes and what some of the standards are happening. I'd like to first start by giving the floor to Sergio to tell us a bit on the radio sector. Uh, what's uh, happening to enable uh, intelligent transportation systems. Sergio. Okay, thanks, Bilal, and good morning, everybody. Uh, as you can see from this picture, uh, you have on board of a car several sensors, uh, detectors of speed, the radars, uh, other systems which uh, detect the uh, nearby ve vehicles or bodies or objects, and... Uh, we have a lot of other systems on board the car, which uh, detects the presence of the people on board, how many people are on board. Then you have the device which you bring with you when you enter into the car. All this makes this environment, from the electromagnetic point of view, very uh, important and radiating in all directions and in all frequency bands. What we need to do, at least what we do in ITU, we try to allocate the spectrum in order to avoid those systems to in, uh, interfere to each other. Because otherwise, when you talk on the phone while on the car, you may interfere with your anti collision radar and the car may activate something which you don't want. So this is something which we have to take care of by separating the generating some distance between the, the frequencies allocated to the specific device. What you also wish to do with the car to avoid that the car interferes with the infrastructure, means outside the car, or connect to the inter infrastructure of a city uh, in order to be like a self-driving car or because you want to have traffic information. But at the same time, you don't want the car to interfere with the uh, airport controls, for instance, while driving in, in an area. Even here, we are very close to the airport. 
our car may interfere with the radar systems of the airport. So we need to have these frequency bands separated and with the noise uh, and sideband noise, which should not generate the troubles to others. So basically, this is the work we do in the radio part. Try to look into these aspects by identifying the spectrum uh, for each specific service and each specific device. And we also try to have this spectrum uh, harmonized everywhere in the world so that you can use your device in any car or any car everywhere in the world. To do that, what we do, we develop some recommendations. We have, uh, uh, in the radio communication center, we have mainly one group which does, it's called the Working Party 5A, which does all the studies, sharing studies, in the use of the frequency and the use of the spectrum uh, for automotive radar and for other kinds of services. So basically, this is the one. I am aware of what is done on the ITUT concerning the other study groups, which probably Bilal will talk to you after. But basically, there is quite a distinction. Whatever is radiated, it is done within our sector. I just go one step forward. These are examples of some recommendations which we have produced. Um, some of them have been very, very recently uh, updated and uh, two, two new ones have been published at the beginning of February. Uh, and there has been a, an event uh, in preparation of the World Radio Conference, which will take place at the end of this year. There has been an, a preparatory event to this conference, which took place two weeks ago, and it lasts two weeks, where we uh, discussed the spectrum allocations for all kinds of services, not only for cars, but also for satellites, maritime, aeronautical, and uh, uh, science, uh, radio astronomy, and all other uh, uh, kind of radio, radio spectrum. So these number of recommendations are of relevance for those car manufacturer or device manufacturer who are interested to see what are the specific bands and what are the uh, techniques to be used in order to be uniform everywhere in the world. So it has to be uh, to allow globalization of those uh, systems and at the same time to allow the harmonization of the use of the spectrum. Try to use the spectrum in a similar way, in an effective manner everywhere in the world. I think that the covers the part that it is of my uh, perspective here. Maybe I'll give back the floor to Bilal to talk about the ITT component about it. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Sergio. So on the ITUT side, uh, we have a number of what we call study groups, which are, is really a group of experts that come together on a particular topic um, and uh, try to work on a question or a problem statement. So uh, in the context of ITS, we have uh, study group 17 that works on security, and it's uh, specifically working on ITS and uh, automotive cybersecurity. Uh, the over-the-air software updates, study group 12 that works on the quality of service and quality of experience. Uh, the study group two that is the uh, perhaps the unique group in the world that assigns the telephone numbers. Uh, and those telephone numbers are also used today for machine-to-machine -to -machine communication. So when we talk about IoT, this group is also assigning those, what we call the standard is E.164, E164 numbers that uh, you heard in the previous panel, all the new cars are connected. And so when they're connected with a SIM card, they have a, a telephone number that's assigned by the ITU, either to a member state and then the member state to the operators, or in the case where the car might be in a shared uh, environment, they're not specific to a geography, it's assigned directly by the TSB director. Uh, it's called the shared code. And we get a lot of those applications today for M2M um, for -M connectivity. We also have a study group 20 on Internet of Things and smart cities. And uh, study group 16 working on vehicle gateway and in-car communication. And in particular, it has a focus group on vehicular multimedia. So just a bit more detail on, uh, on these uh, items. Um, a couple of years ago, uh, ago, Hyundai Motor joined ITU. Uh, so it's not, ITU is not just telecom or ICT. We're getting 
automotive industry to join us as members. And they joined the ITU because of the over the air uh, software updates and how to secure that communication and ensure that um, the cyber threats associated with downloading software to the vehicle over the air are addressed. And now we have a standard called ITUTX.1373 uh, that is looking at uh, this particular problem statement. And um, the nice thing about the ITU standard is that once they're published, they're freely available for download in PDF form. All you have to do is Google uh, the standard name or the number and you can uh, download it and use it. Uh, there is adjacent to that over the air software updates, a number of what we call work items or draft new standards covering various aspects of V2X communication, uh, security, um, external devices, uh, intrusion detection guidelines to uh, edge computing. So uh, the next panel will touch in more detail on the cybersecurity aspects, but we wanted to leave you with this foundational work uh, of international standards on the cybersecurity aspects of uh, over-the-air uh, updates. Study group 12 that uh, has traditionally worked on voice quality has been also addressing voice quality in the context of vehicular uh, multimedia or vehicular um, uh, domain. Um, today, when you bring your phone into the car, um, in the car, most of the modern cars have a uh, audio uh, multimedia system inside. And there is a protocol and a standard in the ITU, the P1100 series, um, that really tells the phones how to behave on, once they are in the car and who's in control, whether the phone or the car, um, uh, um, uh, video, you know, multimedia system that's in charge. And whether the phone adheres to this protocol or not um, will be listed in our certified set of phones. And by being certified, it provides a better quality of voice in the car. And so we have um, regular testing um, events. We've had one at Telecom World in Bangkok a few years ago, last, uh, last year in, in Busan, uh, where we try to certify mobile phones to make sure they um, adhere and comply with the ITU standard when it comes to the voice quality within the car. We also have uh, study group 12 that has a standard on uh, emergency calls. And uh, Her Excellency Olga mentioned this this morning that is now part of the uh, P29. And uh, it makes reference to the ITU standard as a mandatory uh, standard that uh, regulators refer to and uh, need to apply when uh, looking at the uh, intelligible uh, e-calls. Um, I mentioned study group two and the uh, assignment of numbers and the rise in demand for M2M connectivity. Uh, the car is part of the uh, IoT the space and it's a connected device. And uh, having uh, the, uh, the international numbering resources for that is something that we do in, in ITU and we call it the global SIM. So it's not associated with a particular country, but it's, it's a SIM that can operate globally. Uh, study Group 20 is addressing the uh, ITS space from uh, a smart city and IoT perspective, and they have a number of standards uh, looking at managing data, uh, because a lot of data is now emerging from those sensors and from the vehicle, and how do you manage and process that data is an important uh, element that Study Group 20 is looking at. Um, it's also addressing the uh, the IoT in a smart city context uh, and uh, providing an, a number of frameworks and, and uh, recommendations on, on this topic. Finally, study group 16, uh, the multimedia study group, uh, has a reference architecture, which we call the vehicular uh, gateway platform, uh, that shows how the communication within the car and from the car to the outside world um, happens or should happen. And uh, this has been adopted by a number of um, manufacturers, uh, both on the ICT and automotive side. Um, and it really provides a very nice and succinct framework on which you can build uh, additional protocols, additional security frameworks, and additional communication uh, uh, protocols outside of the vehicle. So um, on top of that uh, foundational framework uh, standard, we have a number of functional requirements for the vehicle gateway, the service requirements, the architecture, and the communication interfaces in and outside of the vehicle. Finally, uh, last year, we uh, launched this focus group on uh, what we call the vehicle or multimedia. 
And uh, we are very pleased to have uh, both uh, the Chinese Association of Automotive and uh, BlackBerry and Honda Motor uh, Company join as in the leadership team of this, uh, of this focus group. They've had uh, some very interesting first meetings. The first one is, was in Ottawa. When we went there, it was interesting to see Ford next to BlackBerry. I think uh, Ford acquired about 200 uh, engineers from BlackBerry because a lot of the technology that was in the smartphone is now moving in the vehicle. And uh, you can see that physically happening, you know, in terms of the engineering uh, mindset and, and expertise moving from a smartphone company to, uh, to uh, an auto, auto, automotive uh, industry. Uh, we had uh, our second meeting in Japan, uh, quite uh, intense and quite um, fruitful in terms of participation. A lot of the Japanese car ma manufacturers joined, Toyota, Honda, and others. And our third meeting will be in Geneva coming up. So call for participation. If you're working in the infotainment or vehicle or multimedia, we would like to uh, invite you to join this uh, focus group. Um, how much more time? Almost done. Okay. Minus 10 minutes. Minus 10 minutes. Okay. So um, these slides will be posted on the, uh, on the website. Um, we have a call for you to join us. The final word is on the uh, CITS. I think Russ mentioned this in the opening. We have the collaboration on ITS. It will have its meeting tomorrow. We'll also uh, invite you to join that. Thank you very much. Can we take Q&A? Thank you so much. Uh, the next session uh, is dealing with cybersecurity, and I invite Michael Sena and his panelists to the floor. Are we uh, are we on? Yeah, let's get another microphone here. Okay, now we're on. Thank you all for, uh, for being here. It's a pleasure to be back. Uh, my name is Michael Senna. I'll be moderating the session on cybersecurity. Um, the main reason that I am here and, and working as a moderator is a few years ago, back in 2015, the ITU reached out to me to help uh, prepare a report that has been used in their standardization efforts, and that report was on cybersecurity and over-the-air updates. Uh, basically, why aren't we making the kind of progress that we need to make, and what are the issues that uh, we need to be addressing? And I'm happy to see that that, that report has now been progressing and is, is now has been issued on the ITU, uh, ITU as one of the uh, reports that is going into uh, standardization. Uh, I've also worked with a number of car companies over the years, and <clears throat> one of the areas that uh, has been of great interest is communications. Um, as we heard in the first session, it's very difficult to touch on any area of communications without discussing the issue of cyber cybersecurity, because uh, cyber being over the air, internet, um, our cars can't communicate with a, an electric system by some wires, uh, we need to be able to move our messages and move data uh, over the air. And when we do, we're open to the kinds of attacks that have occurred in, um, in some of the white hats and hopefully uh, not yet, but uh, potentially with some black hats and gray hats. We have a, an expert panel here today. Uh, and as Russ Shields said in, in the first session, we, uh, we as have decided to uh, work with a discussion format as opposed to a stand up and present, present something and then have questions. What I've, I've understood in the years of coming to sessions like this and seminars and symposia is that everyone comes with at least one question and they would like to leave with that question answered. So I'm assuming that there are a number of people here right now who have a question that they would like answered on cybersecurity. And I'd like you to make sure that when you leave this room, 
it is answered. We've got an hour and approximately 30 minutes to do that. Um, the format that I've chosen to, to work with, and with, uh, with our panel is not to leave it open to their mind, but to ask each one of them a question based on their expertise in the areas that they're, they're working in. Um, our first panelist, who uh, will open the discussion and open our, our uh, panel discussion, is uh, Miguel Bagnon, and he is the uh, Vice President of Business Line Security at DECRA. And those of you who don't know DECRA uh, can do, do a little Googling, and I think uh, Miguel will give us a little bit of, of uh, an understanding of what DECRA is. Um, what are the specific areas that specific areas that, that a company like DECRA working with, with vehicle inspection has found to be necessary to address in the area of cybersecurity? How, how is that incorporated into the, the, uh, the process of what DECRA does with certification, with um, uh, inspection? Miguel? Okay, thanks for the easy question and thank you for the audience uh, good afternoon for a few minutes okay um, I'm afraid uh, my experience in cyber security comes back to 20 something years I would like to say it's much less but I've been working on cyber security or IT security as we call it at that time testing and certification for a long time and I'm recently new to DECRA uh, I have been um, heading a common criteria crypto testing lab for more than 10 years. So DECRA has taken a very fast and aggressive approach, incorporating no knowledge, know-how, capabilities to certify, to test, and, and to provide services to the automotive industry. In that, my new coming to this sector, what I found is that in comparison to other um, type of technology vendors or producers, which we have been our usual customers, the automotive sector is new to the problem of cybersecurity. Um, when I started working in the aerospace sector, safety was everything. And I, of course, safety is well engaged into the engineering processes, qualification, all those things in the automotive. But cybersecurity is not. So we have capabilities to certify components. We can certify common criteria, crypto devices. We are certifying system networks, all of these things, but not today in the automotive sector. So what we have found is that there is a need to learn very quickly from other uh, type of products. We have to, the automotive sector has to learn, the experiences learn from other and apply them very quickly because we have seen that this layering of um, components, providers, all these things still needs to engage the cybersecurity methodology, engineering maturity, which we don't see it today. So coming back to your question, how are we approaching these things? We have already capabilities to perform uh, security evaluation. We can provide cap uh, testing services. Um, but we probably are ahead of the of the race. Uh, probably our horses are still, uh, as of today, too advanced, and we are waiting for the courage to come. So we see a urgent need to develop a standards, regulation, and a real uh, transformation of the sector, because our security has to be taken into account from the very beginning, as we are already doing with safety. Okay. Do you? Do you find that there are any countries or any parts of the world, I and mean, DECRA is, is covering, I, I believe is covering all of, of uh, Europe, uh, do you find that there are any specific areas that are more advanced than others when it comes to tr either trying to ensure from a country standpoint, like in Germany, for example, uh, than in other countries? Yes and no. Um... Yes, because our different cultural approach, for example, in Europe, we rely or we expect legislation to, to come and guide us. Mm -hmm. Whereas in the US, they are more looking at the insurance and, 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 and economic self um, progressing. 
So in that sense, yes, there are a difference. But however, because the market is global, at the end of the day, the component is coming from the same factory or anywhere in the world. And they're just waiting for looking up to see which one is the first to impose cybersecurity requirements or qualification requirements or certification requirements in them. Mm -hmm. So at the top level, yes, we see differences. But on the um, producing manufacturing facilities, I think it's still there waiting to see what happens. So where where are we? I mean, where, where do you feel that the, that the whole issue of certification for cyber cybersecurity is at, at this stage? Is it something that's that's very far in the future or is it something that's that's hopefully, going to happen now? Hopefully it's something that is coming very quickly, uh, at least in Europe. And because of the common market, it will have a global impact. However, the problem with component certification or cybersecurity certification, you don't get cybersecurity by piecewise approach. You need a fully holistic approach. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's the major revolution I, I like to see happening quickly. Mm -hmm. um, well, I know there's there's at least one p person on the panel from a country that's working on these issues, who might have a question for Miguel. Uh, Darren, what what's happening? I'm going to ask you your question, but uh, specifically with this issue of certification or with with uh, with inspection, is there something that's going on in the U the UK that uh, you can share with us? Um, I think it's more at the UN level. Mm -hmm. So we have a draft regulation, and for cybersecurity for vehicles and that's got two parts to it one is making sure the organizations are set up to actually do the processes that they need to do to develop things securely and support them maintain them um, and then there's the actual vehicles and within that there will be a cascading requirement for suppliers and supply chain um, which obviously it's a draft regulation so I think it's a very good point that it's a bit of a chicken and egg thing that maybe not everyone will be certified as they are in like the defense industry um, where suppliers are, can show that they're set up to do cybersecurity, mm. but it will come. And yeah, regulation will probably help, um, but the people who are doing it well will be there already. Okay, sure. There is something new here. There is a, a new challenge that hasn't been faced in the past by any vendor. Because until now, if you were a technology provider, let's say you are the selling operating systems, you care about your product, but you rely on the end user to set up the environment, all these things. So you were focused on product qualities. Or if you are providing a service, you are in charge of providing the service, but then you don't care about the product because that's the responsibility of the end user. But here we're mixing everything. So we are delivering vehicles who happen to, happen to be a product that you buy, but then they're engaged into services. So from the certification point of view, we're creating a nightmare because we had a lot of history, background, standards, things like that to develop product-specific certification or systems, clouds, things like that. But the, 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 the future vehicle is a mix. And that's quite a nightmare from the standards and certification point of view. Warren, you had a point. Yeah, just one point uh, to what you just said, Darren. Um, I think what you just described in terms of the standardization uh, divided into two parts, right? The organization aspects and processes and the requirements from the supplier represent a gap. One of the gaps we see in the industry around cybersecurity is that the way car makers used to work, which is here's my spec to the suppliers, please give it back to me and, and buy thank you. That's not enough anymore. And what they need is in, in addition to the organization, they need their own technology, their own systems, their own solutions uh, to be proactive, to monitor it on an ongoing basis, to be able to mitigate and react. And that's the part we see missing today. Most OEMs are investing in hardening in again, telling the suppliers, secure it and give it to me secured. But that's only the beginning. And what we're missing today in the industry is what happens after. How do you become proactive? How do you mitigate? How do you monitor? How do you analyze? That's the part that is still takes too much time to implement. 
Is there anyone who's working with certification or is specifically focused on, on cybersecurity that, that uh, could offer some suggestions or has some questions on the issue of certification and inspection? Okay, Koji. Thank you. Okay, Sam. Thank you. Um, th this is Ko Koji uh, Naka, uh, so working for ITUT, our uh, study 17, our uh, standardization body. And the, as for certification, and there are many, many discussions, in, in, even in ITUT, but also ISO, SC27. And the, in the case of our certification of organization or services, it's quite different from the certification of vehicle itself. And the, as we are often discuss how to threat assess, assessment or how to risk assessment, is, is may, might be the very, very important topic for us. But the how to conduct risk or how to conduct risk assessment or threat assessment is not easy. And in Japan, I, I like to talk about a little bit about in J Japanese situation. In Japan, we try to make uh, some penetration test targeted to the some vehicle offered by some of OEM vendor and try to check in the inside the CAN network or external using external accessible devices and to, to find out some the uh, threats based on the impact analysis. And such a kinds of activity seems to be very, very important, but not easy. So in Japan, we have some of the uh, new project, which is SIP, Strategic in, uh, Innovation Project, which is very, very focused on automotive and uh, driving environment. And the, they uh, try to, to summarize and clarify the kind of scenario, attack scenario, to find out some of the some some of the uh, assessment method, how to uh, verify the uh, vehicle itself. But the such a kinds of activity may be connecting to the certification of vehicle itself, or including some of the attack interface. However. As we discuss often, often discuss the vehicle communication is not so simple ecosystem. So it, vehicle are connecting to many uh, the out 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 <clears throat> somehow including uh, backend system etc. In IoT devices or T uh, telematic uh, unit etc. So maybe we need to to. Are assessed in a total ecosystem as a vehicle, because, for example, the uh, I'm sorry, just I'd like to give you one example. I'm working for NICT, which is research entity under the ministry, and we have uh, observing the some of the IoT device scan from all over the world. And when I got some scan from the one country, and try to to scan back by using port eighty which is web interface. And we recognize such a kinds of a scan device is located in the parking management system. But the, that means parking management system may be infected by malware. That's, that means if vehicle implement some of the parking automat automatic, automatic parking system as an agent, such a kind of vehicle may be injected by uh, the malware, by the parking management system. Such a kinds of the, uh, the attacking scenario is a one of the example, but the, we need to not only focus on vehicle itself, but to focus on somehow ecosystem globally. So certification is maybe we need to, to quickly develop and implement such kind of system, but the not easy to to establish, at least in Japanese situation. But is is Japan developing such a certification? Uh, we approach? have not yet. We have not yet. But the, we are now developing a kind of our software update procedure in the Japanese environment. Yeah. 
if, if, if just to add um, one point at least from Shay. from uh, where uh, we see it. So my name is Shai Horowitz and I'm from Simorev. Um, I think the challenge divides into two. A is how do we make sure that vehicles that are SOP, they go down from the production line, they are cyber safe. And this is a problem that we need to solve as an industry. But uh, the bigger question is how do we keep them safe over 10 and 15 years? which is the time that the OEM is liable for the vehicle. And whether we can use technology to our favor to maybe take one step advantage of hackers and maybe protect the vehicle before the attack is coming into the vehicle. So as an industry, uh, if we talk about traditional OEMs, if, if they have recall or if they pre predict that some element in the vehicle is malfunctioning, they know exactly what to do. They have the processes and... To my understanding, they do it quite well. But when it comes to cyber, this is the area where the OEM, oh sorry, the, the industry is still on the learning curve, how uh, to be able to keep the vehicle safe over 15 years, because with cyber, every day is the SOP. So today the vehicle is safe, tomorrow any vulnerability is coming to the market or is, is exploited, and then how does it impact my fleet as an OEM? This uh, this gets to the, to, uh, the question that, uh, I'm going to ask Martin, um, Martin Rosales, the uh, CEO of, of Wireless Car. Um, <clears throat> we worked together for quite a long time uh, with Wireless Car, and one of the one of the issues that Wireless Car has always had to address is that they're working as part of a, a very large ecosystem. Uh, starting 20 years ago, that ecosystem has grown. Um, how do you see the end-to-end -end compl complexity of adding an additional level of, of uh, requirement for cybersecurity, Martin? Well, to start with, I don't think you can add cybersecurity. <laughs> you need to work with it from the beginning. Uh, that's, that's the number one findings we have. Uh, but you're right, uh, Mike. We, when we started to work in this industry, and wireless car is, uh, work is white branded supplier to the core OEMs. We, we sell our capabilities, which is services and consulting to build the backend for connected vehicles. Uh, and, and by definition, that could be a lot and uh, we are doing a lot. But if we look on the core business we're doing, that is really connecting uh, the vehicles, uh, put them into a context where we manage all the data uh, the, the master data around the car and the users, and then we take all this data and we use that to produce uh, B2B and B2C services. Not doing everything, we're building ecosystems, and we've heard about ecosystems a lot today. And that's a definition which is wide as well. Uh, but in our case, we're doing this for uh, car manufacturers like Jaguar, Land Rover, Volvo cars, uh, Mercedes-Benz, Vans and Cars, uh, Subaru, um, and Volkswagen. So it's global systems. And you know, when we look on this from the whole value chain, you can start to look in, into the cars. And there are car, Volvo cars we worked that we started to work together with Mike. We've done Volvo cars since year 2000. And there are still cars from 2006 in that system. So you can imagine how many versions of in-car technologies and communication devices and protocols that we need to manage. And of course, you, you can't have the same security on you know, this year's model as you have on the 2006. So that's an extreme complexity to, to start with. And then you add all the different OEMs and all their models you're building up. So it's a huge complexity. Uh, moving up, uh, we all know we've gone from very traditional on-prem solutions, and everyone is talking about cloud. Uh, the fact is that no one is 100% cloud today, or uh, you know, in a hybrid situation, or uh, mostly on on-prem. And since the last three, four years, we have started to do more pure uh, cloud implementations, and but most of uh, hybrids. That's another implication to security. And you go to different markets. Our customers are on typically between 60 and 70 markets today where we supply these uh, services. And then you need to look on to the different uh, geographies. Uh, 
now it's about regulations and laws and GDPR coming in, into force in in, um, in Europe uh, last May has uh, implicated a lot on how we look on on uh, security in general. We have the Cloud Act from uh, our friends in, in the US, who is you know basically just complicating things. 100 times then you go to china you're not uh, allowed to do encryption by the cloud technologies and you know so you you ending up with a complexity which is uh, uh, really hard to deal with and if you don't start thinking security and i'm talking about my organization 400 plus, where 90% is DevOps teams or DevSecOps teams, if you would like to say it. I would like to say that because we, it starts there. If we don't work you know, properly with security, with each and every developer from start, it doesn't work in the end. But then we are just one part in the chain. So in an ecosystem, which is typically 30, 40 uh, different partners, Everyone needs to think <laughs> about this from the start. And then we need to also set a strategy for, for uh, security, which is owned by the OEM. And uh, someone pointed out the fact that the OEMs are actually moving into this with uh, not so much maturity and knowledge. So they need to build it up as well. But each and every of our customers are actually going back to your uh, discussion about Japan, uh, are, are doing uh, thoroughly tests so even if you know we use hybrid solutions or old technologies i mean the oems they they need to do the tests and if you remember one of the brands i said are actually selling fleets to mi6 you can imagine the, <laughs> the type of pen tests they're doing on the systems there mm. but it's difficult because uh, moving you know in, in the, this other hybrid solution from a product to services as you pointed out uh, complicates uh, things as well. So that, and then we have the macro factors, and and um, you know, in my role, I'm not sitting as a security expert. So I'm more trying to convey the the complexity in in um, what we need to manage under you know the label cyber security. Then we have the macro factors with uh, autonomous vehicles or AD. Uh, how will that that you know, complicate things over time. Uh, but I'm not too worried because we have extreme small use ca cases in very small segments with limited <laughs> approaches to it. We have the um, electrification, which I think is the bridge to the better world because with electrification, we actually remove 70, 60 to 70 percent of the components in the car with software. And, and that will drive. Uh, firmware and software update strategies in the core, which is extremely important uh, because we cannot fix problems or um, loopholes if we can't update the core on the fly. So that, that's going to be imperative. <clears throat> and then, of course, the whole sharing community or service community where we start to use cars in, with you know, unknown users. Today, it's quite easy. We know to 99 percent who is using the car so just a few <laughs> factors in in the complex complexity of the liver this the, the the role that that wireless car has filled over these last 20 years has primarily been the link between the vehicle and the service providers it's it's been the channel it's been the the secure connection to the vehicles so in the case of volvos and jaguar land rovers two companies that i've worked with the only way you get into that car is via wireless car, is via the telematic service provider. Um, but the data that's coming through and the data that's passing through is coming from the vehicles coming and going to other sources. Do you see this role changing where the, the, the connection to the vehicle, yes. for some reason, is now going to be different because of a new technology or a new service provider? Now where you're going, yeah. Mike. Yeah. Um, Absolutely, and um, now we uh, start to flush with uh, great words again. But we all know about edge computing, and and of course that's gonna that's happening as we speak. Uh, we don't really see it in the course so far, but um, edge technology. And I, what I think is 
really going to be uh, big is uh, the cloud providers edge technology like um, Microsoft with um, uh, edge as they call their product which is basically taking a, a, a sub component of the cloud with functionality and bring it into the car I don't believe that will be the new op OS in the car because the OEMs really want to manage that operating system environment but it will be a technology which will be 100% associated with the cloud on ground or in in the heaven or whatever you would like to, to put it. Um, Amazon Web Services have uh, uh, green grass as a good example. And every OEM with um, respect are looking into um, uh, this technology uh, right now. And that will actually standardize. Uh, it will not be a triple uh, A a standard or anything like that, but it, it, it will provide a standardized and much more secure way uh, in the future. I'm looking at you. Any questions? Any points? Any Anything on the issue of communicating with the vehicle? You're going to have to put your hats on. I'm going to expect some questions. Okay, thank you, Martin. Amir, I'm going to turn to you now. Um, Karamba Security, you promote the idea of the self-defending vehicle. Do I use the right term? Yep. Yeah. Right. So uh, we're we're seeing uh, really the transformation and through uh, autonomous self-driving vehicles. Um, is there something that we can learn from the white hat attacks that, that were made on uh, Tesla and and on Jeep that can give us some guidance into where we're going with, with that whole issue? Yeah, and I think, so I'm Amir Inav, I'm uh, VP Marketing for Caramba Security. Um, I want to connect to the point about the certification and the standards, and so, you, you know, you rush to the, where is this, the, the, um, ecosystem around us is but if you look at the manufacturers themselves and the tier ones and the industry as such um, I, I believe there is a um, tremendous uh, uh, progress over the last few years in, in the issue of cybersecurity and I think some of that should be uh, uh, credited for those white hat attacks so while we didn't see yet uh, significant uh, black hat sort of real serious attacks on vehicles but we did see proof of concept by people that really know what they're doing and the outcome of that is that the industry is taking taking uh, notice. It's it's I don't know if it's so much about certification or, or progresses as such, but it definitely we see more people in the uh, so we engage with 17 different OEMs and, and customers that are actually uh, working with our technology. We see more people on the OEM side and the tier one side, people that are expert or understand cybersecurity. The discussion is becoming more and more intelligent as the year pass, which is great. I think that's you know it's it's a muscle the industry has to develop. There's no question we don't have that muscle originally, maybe three, four years ago or, or more, but more and more uh, organizations now are, are developing this capability. I think uh, in terms of, I mean, in an era of software-defined vehicle, you have to have it. There's no question. People are not wondering now anymore. And the, the uh, proof of concept that the attackers were able to show uh, from the very famous uh, Jeep all the way to the latest uh, I think what was the latest? Uh, no, let's keep on coming, so it's hard to uh, follow. I think the last one was Subaru, actually. Um, they, they, are, they are able to show significant issues in the way that the vehicles are designed and the vehicle are, are uh, manufactured, sometimes simple things, sometimes sophisticated things. And when we came up with this uh, self-defending car, we were thinking, okay, we have to help the manufacturing side. This, are, first and foremost, is a manufacturing industry. We have to help them on that level to turn out a, a vehicle that comes out of the gate secure. Now, yes, there has to be afterwards uh, a services layer up, ab above that. They have to have they have to have the over the air uh, capabilities in order to fix things that missed through the development cy cycle. But the built-in security is is a must in an industry so complex. I mean, if you think about it, the, the vehicle is one of the most complex machines out there. Beside of the 100 million units a year, it's also by itself. It's a huge chunk of our um, annual investment as a, as a consumer, but it's also a huge uh, technology masterpiece. So by definition, there are things to be done there by the attackers and therefore by the defenders. 
So what what specifically can we learn from from what's been done so far? I mean, um, how many of you saw the video of the attack on the Jeep? All of you here, I assume, most, seems like most people. I need people, to send you guys. Hmm? Yeah. Um, I mean, when, when I looked at that, and, and the experience that I had had up to that point was that none of the vehicles that I had had anything to do with or any, any, anyone that I knew of in the industry had had an attack on a vehicle. So this, this was done in a way that in order for them to complete this mission that they were on, they really did have to have help. And they needed drawings. They needed to do something that they couldn't do. Do are we? Is anyone aware of a of an actual black hat attack on any of the connected vehicles anywhere? So there was just now a, a report coming up by a cybersecurity startup that listed all the attacks that were um, measured. A lot of them are, you know, on the enterprise side, and a lot of successful ones are actually on the level of uh, the key and stealing the car. Mm -hmm. So a lot less dangerous. But if you look at the, what the white hat hackers were able to do from yeah. Jeep to uh, Tesla to BMW, I mean, significant significant brands that definitely everybody understands that they know how to develop software. Yeah, It's not, you know, like they played with the, with the kids. And they were able to control speed and direction, mm -hmm. which means that they are able to control the car. So these kind of attacks are, are safety attacks. They're not, I can steal your car, or I can uh, breach your privacy and steal some data. They're actually attacking the car as a, as a, as a, as a target that by impacting its safety, you can then translate that to all sorts of input, impacts such as ransomware, such a corporate level ransomware. I mean, it can be all sorts of uh, implications of that capability. So the, the thing was, Working in an evaluation testing lab, um, the only factor that you need to take into account when considering whether the, the system is has vulnerabilities or not is time and effort. So I think the only reason why we are not seeing attacks in the field is that they don't have a business case yet. Um, that's the only reason. Uh, as soon as they have a business case, you will see things happening. So. Uh, until now, it's just an exercise for the sake of self-promote, promoting your services or things like that. But in, in I mean, uh, from my point of view, it's as simple as that. Uh, so the first time they have, they can use it to steal cars. So you see those things on the field. But for the self thing of the connected, whatever, is that a matter of putting services into play that allow the bad guys to have a business case for for breaking it, and you will see that. I couldn't agree more. I think what we saw in terms of uh, vehicle hacks, these are just uh, the very start and frankly speaking are not so interesting from black, black hacking uh, point of view. What, what the gentleman from DECA said, I forgot your name, sorry. Uh, Miguel, yeah, sorry. Uh, is, is the interesting part where if a hacker put a malware that uh, uh, will lock the vehicle, for example, in parking until you pay 300 euros in Bitcoin, and this goes to 100,000 or 500,000 vehicle, this is a nightmare scenario in terms of cyber, uh, and this is where the real challenge of the industry is. I want to react on the business case. The business case is there. When the white hack uh, of Jeep was announced, it resulted in multi tens of millions of dollars that FCA Jeep had to put out or pull out of their pocket, including, you know, they started by sending memory sticks to drivers, to customers, okay, um, I think four million of them. Each one cost whatever, um, plus the communication. They ended up paying fine to the government. They ended up, you know, in, in making a lot of changes to the system. I think overall they had to pay more than $50 million, okay? This is the business case. Now, if it was a black hat and they would call FCA and say, listen, we're going to have a video tomorrow and it's going to end up costing you $100 million or you can just pay us 20 Yeah, but this is, this is exactly the point. The business case for the OEM, what you just said, is, is clear. But, the but for the hacker... It's, it's tough. And actually, uh, Chris and Charlie, who are known for this hack, they approached FCA. They ignored them at the time, so they went public. But 
they were now, now, they, now they know better. <laughs> no, but 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 the thing is that I am not aware of any uh, uh, hacking what was which was not made a fleet wide so far. All was done, luckily, uh, for white hacking for uh, taking the industry a step forward. And if you were in the industry three years ago, it is uncomparable to where the industry is today. So if you go to OEMs and you see the security divisions, you really see the real experts there. So they are learning and they are learning fast, to my opinion. Uh, and I believe that uh, what we saw as three years ago and from time to time is just pushing the industry forward. I think it's these white hackers, they do a great service because at the end of the day, we are all in interest of the connected car. This is part of our lifestyle today. And we speak about autonomous and clearly security is a must for that. And in that respect, uh, uh, this is the way to push the industry forward uh, in order to bring a better product. And definitely security will come as safety problem. It's not security, it's safety. Koji? Okay. Um, <clears throat> thank you. Um, as for uh, the hacking the car, so um, in my company, NRCT, which is a research entity under the ministry, I have more than 10 white hackers. And that they are conducting the uh, penetration test for the, some of the e existing car. But the we, uh, I, I'm sorry, I, I cannot provide more specific information. Mm -hmm. But the uh, if we detect some of the uh, vulnerability or weakness, it depends on the specific car. Not not this car has this vulnerability, but this is not. So, but the problem is the it's not easy for us to share such a each vulnerability among the server or in vendor. Very to say, the in our Japanese member uh, start discussing to uh, have some common verification method for checking each OEM vendor or each OEM component of the vehicle to check this way and based on the uh, penetration test. And the such a kinds of mechanism is sometimes not easy because the most of the OEM vendor is not willing to disclose everything. This is depends on their our OEM vendor itself. So the having such a kinds of activity, the cyber security is finally providing the good countermeasure. And the self are uh, of course defending vehicle is maybe uh, the one of the target for our activity, but the in ITUT, for instance, we can provide the the kind of the uh, external device accessible some threat or the kind of how to define or how to uh, develop the intrusion detection inside the car. It's a kind of uh, abnormal behavior detection, not uh, signature based de detection. So it's the kind of very series of technology need to be somehow developed, somehow total security. But the it's starting, what is the starting point for, for such a kind of countermeasure is the based on the threat assessment. So it's a chicken, somehow chicken egg, but the- Chick The chickens came first. <laughs> Sorry, oh. I agree. Finally. <laughs> That's the answer, the chickens That's came it. first. Okay. We're good, let's, let's go. Can I uh, can I refer to this uh, point for a second? I think <laughs> no, I have nothing to add on that. Um, but regarding the sharing, the, the point about sharing. So I'm I'm coming to the automotive industry from cybersecurity. Uh, so it's only been my, my first year in cyber, in automotive, which is a lot of fun. It's a great industry. It's going to be a great show today. Mm -hmm. um, in in the regular world, cybersecurity. I mean, and it's a very competitive industry for sure. And and the, and the players are not talking to each other, and there's a very um, high interest on IP and protecting IP and between the vendors and the and the customers and, and what have you. But in cybersecurity, I think it's critical to share and it's critical to to um, 
to to exchange ideas and uh, technologies because uh, the bad guys do. So if if we don't share and they do, we are in lim limitation. And they have the dark web. They have a place to share. There is actual places where you can put in a, in a in a. I mean, think about it. criminals share between them, and it works for them. So uh, the Otto Isaac in the U.S. started this. I think it's working very well for them. Uh, we joined a strategic partner at the end of last year because we believe that this is a good place for us to bring what we see to the uh, community. But I think in, in a, in a, as a, an effort also in the EU, there has to be a stronger effort to find ways. And it's clear, again, anti-competitive. How does those players can talk to each other? But I, I give you an example. In a, in a certain country that I know, the chief security officer of the banks have an instant messaging between them. And of course, they are competing fiercely, but security has to share. Yeah. Aline, I see you've picked up the uh, the mic, please. Yes, uh, thank you. So, Aline Gouget, I'm a, a cryptographer. I, I work for Jim Alto. And uh, I have to, to agree uh, really with the fact that uh, what is really important is the risk assessment and the, the, the understanding of the global security to know really uh, what are the attack paths, the different attack paths to reach the same goal. And it is really important to know that from the beginning. Uh, I mean, uh, without uh, even uh, having already decided how it will be implemented, which, which, uh, which components and so on. I mean, uh, this first risk analysis is already very important and we can uh, already see and uh, have kind of uh, prioritization, sorry. On, uh, and see also, uh, yes, uh, different ways to reach the same goal for an attacker and, and understand that. So uh, after that, I think it's really important and to have the, the components and do uh, real testing, penetration testing and so on. But really, there are different layers uh, to take into account to really have the understanding of what is indeed the, the security in the end. And uh, I think it was mentioned several times. So uh, in the for the automotive industry here, I seems that everything is in the same place. So a big complexity um, just because I think there's really many things at the same place, which uh, was not really the case, I think, in the past in the other industry. If we were talking about uh, uh, banking and uh, financial uh, industry, for example, even government, uh, I think for the, the uh, identity uh, verification and things like that, it seems to me that uh, in the automotive industry, you have just everything. At the same place so uh, the complexity is uh, by design and i think it's very important to not add additional complexity where, where it is not needed and especially be sure that when you you put some security in one specific component this is really in this one that uh, or uh, maybe the others but be sure that uh, this additional complexity because after you you have to maintain that you have Sorry, to do uh, the full life cycle of uh, of the of the credentials, the keys you will load into uh, into this component and so on. So, I mean, uh, really, and I agree. You mentioned that uh, twice. I think uh, the, the the risk assessment at the beginning is really really important. To uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. Koji. Okay. <clears throat> so sorry, in in connection of the uh, cryptographer. Um, uh, my my organization uh, is also working for the cryptography in the one of the member or uh, oh, oh, no no the, we our team are now pro producing or proposing the kind of how to utilize the lightweight cryptography inside the, our automotive environment so maybe how to such a kind of constrained uh, environment so no cpu or memory size is uh, somehow limited Inside a car, the canvas is very, very limited. So how to make the communication inside a car while going outside the car should be secure. And the it's kind of depend on the uh, fundamental technology. So not only authentication, key exchange, or cryptography is are uh, the major issue. So I would like to know the is there any our uh, idea how to utilize a lightweight crypto or any specific idea great okay i'm sorry i'm not moderator but no maybe but you I, I no but you, you've done something that i was hoping the the our our group here would do is uh, you've asked a question 
<laughs> so, and the answer is? Yeah, so we realized that there is such a, a challenge actually in, in Caramba, and it's the second product we came up last in the 2008 of 2017, and it's really based on, on authentication and encryption. It's exactly that logic, and it's really because the can is so limited. The, the ability for you to use authentication in the CAN in an effective way is limiting. So each ECU can encrypt and decrypt what it's getting, and we managed to show it in a very light way, so it's not uh, affecting the performance. Maybe one point, I need when you are talking about lightweight cryptography, you need also to specify what are the constraints of that, because there are plenty of style of lightweight cryptography. So to, to be sure that it is really suitable and this is what you need, you have to, to, to describe, to know at least what are the constraints. Which type of, uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, I'm, I'm going to go out, out of order here because I think we're, we're, we're in a flow here. And to stay with, with you, I mean, because you're, the question that I had for you was, was on the, how do you secure this, the, the secure, the secure, sorry, how do you secure, <laughs> and I teach a moment, yeah, exactly. <laughs> how do you secure the, the, um, yeah, they are okay. The starting to say okay. Security, security by design. How do you build that in? Because it, what you've said is that it's gotten so complex. Is it too complex? Is it so complex that we can't ensure that we have security by design? Or is it? Or is there? Is this some trick that we can we can uh, bring into the picture here? No, I, I don't say it's too complex, but I mm -hmm. say it's uh, it's uh, complex by design. So it is really important to be sure to, to not add additional complexity where it is not uh, really needed. Just, uh, voilà, it just don't, uh, the idea is not to say, okay, uh, I will put, uh, I want everything secure, so I will put everything at top level security everywhere. So we, are, we will, it will generate a lot of uh, complexity without really knowing where it is really required. This, this was my point. But I don't say it's too complex. I just say to understand really what, let's say, what types of uh, trade-offs can we uh, consider between software, hardware, cloud, and so on, we need to understand really uh, the, the big picture of the security. So the risk assessment and say uh, and have really uh, in mind where we should uh, focus uh, first on the security for which level. And the complexity means here for me, uh, we need to have um, the view about, um, we cannot just uh, look at the, the, the component. We need to have the view about the use cases and see what are the possibilities typically from the, when you do an assessment in terms of what are the main attack paths and things like that. Mm -hmm. Here, we need to understand the use case and see what is access, uh, uh, accessible for the attacker. Knowing that now, the attacker can attack everywhere in the supply chain. So we have to have that in mind. Uh, we don't say, okay, it's okay because uh, with one between one component and another component, I put some security and there's the keys and everything is okay. It's not sufficient because maybe the problem came just before. So you just use uh, an authentic channel to transfer your data, but the problem arise just before. So that's why it's really important to know really uh, voilà, to have um, uh, the right level of information to do the assessment and to, to be able to identify the different uh, ways the attacker can use to, to really attack. Hmm. I'm going to, Martin, yeah, we've got a question here, but the, the, you made a point. You said that I'll insert the vehicle and the vehicle and communications is complex mm -hmm. by design. Martin made a point that the electrification is simplifying the vehicle. Uh, not only mechanically. I'm going to I'm going to make a statement, just like chickens came first. Um, that there is one car maker who's put the two together to create very simple electric car. That at this point in time is the easiest car to update, and the question will be, is this an easier car to ensure cybersecurity? You know which car I'm talking about. So this is a question for everybody on the, on the panel. Um, if, if we reduce complexity in the vehicle, 
and electrification allows us to reduce that, that complexity, is the problem simpler than the one that we have today? Shaking heads, yes, uh, no, yeah. I know which company you're talking about. Yeah. Obviously, Tesla, right? Everybody, yeah. you know, and, and they did simplify. And I I actually relate to, I think, what uh, was said there, that the simplification they've done was on the architecture and mainly the mechanical aspects. Still, the attack vectors are the same. They have connectivity, right? They have uh, cellular connectivity. They maybe have Wi-Fi connectivity inside the car. They have Bluetooth. They, this is where the risks are coming from. It doesn't come from the fact that in order to, uh, I don't know what, accelerate the car, you need one ECU instead of four. That doesn't change anything. I mean, um, it changed a lot of things. Maintainability, uh, update is easier, and, and you know, we, we do it, we help them do that, so we know that. Uh, but I don't think it changed the risk. Well, I, I think um, it's a matter of attack surface, as, as was said. So the attack surface is growing, okay, because we want more services, more interfaces, more connectivity. So for hackers, that situation is getting better, yeah? Uh, this is uh, one point. I think what makes the company you mentioned uh, different is that they think like a software company, not like an OEM uh, manufacturer. And this gives, gives them an edge in the areas where software plays a key role. But I want to refer to the previous statement because from my point of view, this is the key. And Alim call it use cases. In, in Cymotive, we call it the attacker's perspective. So the first thing which needs to be done, and here there's still a gap, uh, at least to my view, is that the industry needs to start to think like hackers. Then only once you understand how hackers are thinking, what is their use case? How they will attack the vehicle in order to get certain uh, malware or certain uh, private information which is in the vehicle, then only once you have this understanding, and it's not from the, uh, from the car perspective, it's from the ecosystem perspective, because maybe the, the, the entry point is from the ecosystem, from the digital app, or from the dealership portal, or from the backend, whatever it is, only once you have this understanding, then you can start think, okay, now I will design, I will do, I will do security by design to my ecosystem. So in our company, we call it the purple approach. It's simply a, a mixing between the attacker, the red approach, and the, and the defender, the blue approach. And we believe that oh, our experience shows that if you follow this approach, you create uh, a nonlinear thinking, which is the right way to tackle the problem, which is definitely a complex problem. Uh, a vehicle is a complex problem because in every uh, uh, minute, there's a different scenario. Even if I drive from my home to my work every day and then back, it's a different way, a different environment. So it's it's quite complex. We all agree. We all understand that. And the the, the right way, to my understanding, to uh, to face the problem is to really think like the hackers. And and this is something which. I think there's still a gap in the industry. So we need more good hackers to join on board, to help us improve, build the use cases, what we call the attacker's perspective. How will attacker approach the problem? And then think about security solution to defend. We have a question. We have two questions. Thank you very much. Uh, Felix Guimar, UNEC, Information System Unit. Uh, very uh, interesting discussion, and thank you to all the panelists. Uh, to, um, uh, to speak about you, what you just mentioned, the, um, the environment and the, how do you manage the cybersecurity. Uh, sometimes industries tend to have an uh, egocentric approach, and they tend to think that their product is the main goal of a hacker. We had examples when hackers infected uh, hundreds or thousands of security cameras, not to get into the video stream, but to use them as a zombie network and to conduct some DDoS distributed uh, denial of service attacks. So how this is taken into account by the car industry and uh, is there something that can be done against that? Thank you. Who would like to take that? 
I think it's an excellent question, uh, and and it goes a little bit back to the question I wanted to post back there after your discussion when you said don't uh, don't add unnecessary complexity. I agree, but the the problem we have, or I mean the opportunity, I should say, because I'm in this industry, is that we are adding all these sensors of different kinds could be cameras or you know the sensors for measuring pressure in the in, in the wheel so i mean that it's going to be a massive explosion of new uh, sensors in in the cars and then we're going for the software defined car and um, that is typically in combination with electrical cars and for a special purpose to actually share them so we opening up on all fronts <laughs> where we start to uh, release uh, APIs for the variant needs. As, as a good example, looking on some of my clients who are open up the car as um, a delivery unit where they get uh, packages from, you know, food companies. You, you actually shop your groceries, you get them into the car. I'm doing that. It's very convenient. Uh, or you can get Amazon delivery into the car. And th these type of APIs are massively starting to be implemented and, and that's another opportunity for hackers. <laughs> uh, now how will they actually penetrate and use all these sensors but it comes from the same typically you know uh, the, the risks we have with all the APIs or every interface where you can uh, actually go in. So I strongly believe uh, that we need to increase the competence because we see this uh, daily in our uh, discussion with all the partners in, in, in the ecosystems. And, and trust me, the ecosystems are not stable. Uh, if you go to, you know, versus markets, you use different map providers, you use, I mean, you're changing partners, MNOs, or, you know, so the, if, if you start to do, you know, the risk assessment, you do a matrix on how many <laughs> risks you have, it's, it's a lot. Is is your question that this hasn't happened yet, and why hasn't it happened? And what's the what's the specific question that so that when? Sorry. Yeah. Thank you very much. So first, how do you assess this risk, and uh, when it will happen? Because it could happen uh, in the coming ten days. How we yeah. should react? Okay. Just first. No, we have a line. Hey, so I, I was thinking to to answer first. I didn't see it yet. So practically, I didn't see the industry concern about that. And I think if I'm analyzing why, I believe that the industry is much more concerned about what's actually going to happen to the car versus the car attacking others. Although I think the example with the lights over there is probably going to come up. Uh, if you think about it, the and 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 in the process, uh, like was mentioned here, in terms of in the process where you do a threat analysis with your customer and talk about what's what's possible, what's what's the highest risk, what's lower risk, what's um, should be addressed first, what should be addressed second. If you think about it, uh, the GPU of the car, the new ADAS, working as a crypto miner for Bitcoin, is much more interesting. So I can actually use the car as as a as a machine for my own use, not necessarily attacking others, which is a very logical and a small code by the IoT device. The, the car is a, a tremendous IoT device. So in a way, if you think about the standardization of IoT, the, the automotive industry has an option of leading that as they get their standardization and certification processes more in place. Just wait a minute. Are you saying that today there are companies using the onboard system like an NVIDIA for Bitcoin Not yet, processing? but I'm saying when we do analysis for safety component like ADAS, yeah. which is based on GPU, that's a much more interesting risk for mm -hmm. that um, machine. We're going to get to the, that question for UK regulations. Okay. Just a uh, great question. First of all, being part of the industry, I think the industry is looking at things like that. We've done research with a university in Israel uh, in the Negev, that what we did is we attacked a speed sign. So we did some, you know, manipulate the speed sign that the human eye still see, let's say, 50 kilometers per hour, but the camera in the vehicle thinks it's 80 kilometers per hour. And for the camera in the vehicle, it, 80, I can drive 80, okay? But it actually should be uh, 50. 
Okay, and so we are experimenting all th things like that. However, when we come to the OEMs themselves, they look at us as what? They don't. They don't. They're still not aware of of the overall risks that that things that you're describing. One more, Koji. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, according to my our research experience, the the we need to to consider the. IoT device in a malware infection into the vehicle malware infection. As you know, the uh, in at, at this point in time, so we have many many IoT devices which are already infected by malware, like a Mirai or Hajime, etc. So we have a lot of type of uh, malware injected to IoT devices. And the country, the most of the attack is based on DDoS. So using the botnet to control C2 server. But the latest malware is a little bit advanced uh, comparing with the previous one. The normally the first three inject malware into IoT gateway, which is maybe router or that type of central system, and to after that, after injected to gateway, the gateway DNS is modified into the malware download server. And their sensor or actuator is located down the gateway. It's tried to connect to the download server to get malware. In the same way, in vehicle, the vehicle gateway is fastly infected by malware and may be infected up, up later to issue. Maybe in the case of vehicle malware injection, is the impact is not, not like a DDoS, but maybe different way. So, but the, in the case of com using command control server, botnet, so the attacker can do almost everything. So I, I think that we need to carefully consider the current IoT mal device malware infection seem to be a similar malware infection into the vehicle environment. So in the case of risk assessment, they, we need to check the external interfaces, or also we need to detect some of the infection inside a car. Maybe such a kinds of method is very, very important for to in conduct risk assessment against the malware in injection. Thank you, Kochi. We got another question. Thank, thanks very much. My name's Ian Arnold. I'm uh, also from the UK Department for Transport. Now, um, <clears throat> to be perfectly honest, uh, I'm a vehicle engineer. I've worked in the government for a long time, and one of my jobs is to actually ensure that vehicles coming on the road are safe. Sorry, am I not mm. speaking close enough? So one of my jobs is to ensure vehicles, new vehicles coming on the road, are safe. Now, everything you've done and spoken about so far has completely undermined my confidence that vehicles are going to be safe. That was the road. intention. Great. Okay. So <clears throat> let me ask maybe all the panel members, and, and it's up to you, uh, Chair, to decide how you handle it, but what is it that you're going to do in really sort of short order in terms of time to provide that confidence, not just to me, but actually the people who are buying the vehicles and are going to be using them. Because just for example, the team I run in London has already got research underway in the notion of vehicle as a weapon. And that's not unique to the UK. Other countries have had similar problems where vehicles have been used as a weapon. And there are real concerns that cybersecurity creates more opportunity for that. So I'd be really grateful to understand what it is you're going to be doing quickly to provide that confidence. Thank you. Yeah, well, you, you've asked, actually asked the question that I was going to, to pose to, to, uh, to Darren, which is what, the, you know, what, is, what, what is the UK doing uh, and what, what do you see as, foresee as the uh, requirements? And then we're going to get to that question with the entire panel. So... Um, as for requirements, in 2017, we published a set of um, principles which were saying organizations need to be set up, and that's supply chain and OEMs. And 
anybody else really playing in the automotive space to do cybersecurity, which is design, maintain, support. And the items themselves need to be hardware, software, data considered for re resilience and support. Um, so actually a lot of what we've talked about on the panel mm -hmm. would fit in line with what we have stated we think the world should be. In order to give that confidence that actually things are secure, it really needs the homework to be shown. That First off, that manufacturers and suppliers have done their due diligence, that they have considered the end-to-end, -end, done their risk assessments, know their system, identified where it could be attacked, and done something about it and they can show and argue the case. And really, it's like the safety case for a vehicle is a cybersecurity case. But is, is this for vehicles that are manufactured in the UK or vehicles that are sold in the UK? Um, UK doesn't is probably not as big as we would like it to be on the global scale. Um, so it has to be done globally. Um, we buy vehicles in from outside the world. Um, so it, the UN level, UNEC level, is the appropriate, unless you are going to only allow vehicles from your own country in, which is not, there's no country in the world which is going to do that. It has to be done globally. So the, now the question is, is anyone doing this? And if they are, to what extent? If they're not, why not? I mean, there is no law that I know of, whether it's a UN law or a country law, that says that cars absolutely have to be cyber secure. You, so we have a draft regulation. <laughs> um, I think as the automotive industry has gearing itself up to do this, the governments and the regulatory bodies around the world are. Um, there are actually a number of laws which you would convene in, uh, contravene if you attack the vehicle mm -hmm. and you could be prosecuted under. So there's prosecution for people who, who perpetrate the crime, but is there, well, maybe there is. Well, there's GDPR, for example. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so there's not a specific vehicle regulation, which is why um, I've been busy doing yeah. stuff at the UN. Um, but there are within domains, and this will vary by country to country, um, probably things in existence, which are maybe a little left field and you have to look for. Um, but in terms of manufacturers having to tell a responsible body what they've done, um, that's where we're going. We recognize there's a need. But we're not there yet. We're getting there. Yeah. Okay. I think there are a few of us working directly with OEMs here. Mm -hmm. I think we, at least a couple of us, are on daily, uh, you know, in operation, trying to solve this problem together with them. Uh, if you look on all my clients, car OEMs, um, I would say. I'll uh, probably divide them in three categories. You you have the, I mean, almost, I mean, I did, this goes hand in hand with premium segments. They're spending a lot of time on this and, and they normally have a strategy uh, and they try to implement it throughout the supply chain. Uh, and, and of course, we're helping out from our position on it. Uh, they're doing thoroughly tests, pen tests, and, you know, I think they're doing a pretty good job. Now, all of us know that. Uh, security around software or cyber security is a constant chase uh, because uh, the bar is just going up all the time so uh, will you always stay you know on top of that bar of course not not even the banks or the financial or econ economical <laughs> industry does that uh, even though uh, you can't or you probably could kill someone by throwing a bag of money on them but uh, a car is more lethal i agree to that so i think you know, the industry is doing a pretty good job. And we also need to understand that, you know, even though we have regulations in each country, uh, the cars are 
built in one place and distributed globally. So that's not an easy one, <laughs> getting how many nations do we have today? Uh, that number <laughs> going in with specification of what you should do. You need to coordinate that and have one global, of course. But I think they are doing a pretty good job. There are a couple of them I'm most scared of working with as well. Uh, so there is a variety of how well they address this problem. But that's my view from working with the OEMs daily on that particular subject. I think they are, and I'll tell you what I mean. I agree with you, you know, to come up with a regulation that says the car needs to be secured is kind of funny because what does it mean? And the hackers will always be a step ahead and maybe you catch up and they will have. So the answer is not let's secure the car. The answer is let's know what's going on in the car after it's secured and let's have a way to mitigate. And the only way to mitigate is by over the year software update. And if there should be regulations, by the way, Bilal, maybe it's something I should be talking to you later on. If there should be regulations around that, then the regulation should be OEMs. You have to have over the air capability. Not only that, if there is a cyber attack that you identify, you have to react within whatever, 24 hours, three days, right? Today, what is, what is the protocol to react today? A recall that takes six, seven, eight, ten 10 months Right? This is not acceptable. So if there is a regulation, it should be, you have to have this mechanism and you have to react very, very fast and you have to prove us that you did it very fast. And, and the reason I'm telling you that I think the industry is going there, you know, I'm, I'm coming from Harman and we uh, about four years ago acquired a company called Redbend and Redbend is one of the leaders in OTA and we have today contract with, contracts with 24 car makers representing maybe 40 different car brands, uh, already 30 million cars on the road doing OTA, 350 million cars contracted to do OTA, right? And it's all in the last two years. So uh, once in a while I'm being asked, why car makers don't do OTA? Well, they do, all of them. And they go deep inside the car and they are investing in that and it's moving ahead. And that's the way to make it safe given the cybersecurity threat. I want to join in relaxing the gentleman over there. So uh, the, the, in, along those lines, I think what we see is that there is awareness. There are, as we said, there are people now on the other side that are listening and trying to put requirements and trying to influence the vehicle uh, uh, specifications. I must add a point to, to Shai's point before. One of our most successful uh, workshops we do with our customers called Think Like a Hacker is exactly where those security people are trying to educate the rest of the organization what's going on. Because they are in our security pockets, but the rest of the organization is starting to get into it. They're not yet there. But to, to uh, Ori's point, the first thing, I mean, what I'm saying is that there is progress is because uh, I think there was just now a survey about about 60% of the manufacturers have a gateway already in the architecture. That's beautiful. That's the first layer of segmentation that has to happen in any cybersecurity uh, architecture over the air like Ori was just saying, is coming up very strong. And it's very much a foundation as well, because you have to have an option of fixing when you, when you see something is wrong. Uh, in, in Caramba, when we are uh, talking about our active hardening sort of technology, we're now doing ACLD certification, because our customers are saying, we take you now down into the, to the safety components. And we need you guys to join us there, certified by yourself as ACLD. So I think in general, the, the notion is that the industry is moving and it's moving relatively good. It's, it's, it's the bear question, right? You know, you, you, you're tying up your shoes, the bear is coming. It will be faster. And, and in reality, if the, I, mean, I want to give a, 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 a ray of hope here. If the industry, this automotive industry, which is huge in terms of money, in terms of capabilities, smart focus, innovative, so are the hackers, by the way. So they have all those attributes. Uh, if the industry is uh, able to move as fast as it should, then the, the attackers won't come because the attackers are like water, right? They're looking for the least resistant option. And if it's easy to do on a, on a, a camera, a DDoS, they'll do that. They're not necessarily going to go after the automotive industry. If the automotive industries keep on raising the bar themselves, making for the attackers, it's not worthwhile. There's not enough motivation. Yeah, just leave it. Move to something else. Yeah. 
Yeah, I have a question moving a little bit away from the uh, Black Hat guys. Um, what is what is about data ownership? Uh, all the data that is generated in cars, uh, privacy, who should use it, and so on. Any any views on that topic? That's a simple one. <laughs> uh, from my perspective, uh, you know, OEM and the car owner use the data, depending on how the data is generated. Uh, and uh, the OEMs are mostly regulated. Uh, you know, if you buy a car, you open up the first uh, page in, in, your, in the manual, and it often describes who is owning the data <laughs> generated by the car. Uh, but then, you know, we have GDPR and other legislations on top of that which so it's a combination um, so i would say uh, the oem and uh, the car owner or the user of the car uh, is actually only the data and i think that's a great debate uh, probably yeah. for a special event <laughs> still still a great debate Warren? yeah i agree with you it's a simple answer uh, but the problem is that the industry is changing and there are other fact, other players coming into this industry that makes this question not very simple. And one of them that is obvious is Google, right? With the uh, evolution or involvement of uh, Android being an operating system that more and more car makers implement in their cars, there is a huge pressure by Google to take control of some of the data. So the answer is simple, but it's being challenged. That's my that's what we see in the industry. So that... I think the jury is still out. Does, does that mean as, as these players come in that the car looks more like a PC and therefore is much more susceptible to everything that happens on our PCs, like the messages that I get every day? In, That's including your yes. phone? Yeah, including my phone, sorry. Yeah, including the phone. Yeah. That is? Yes. That I mean, is exactly what's happening. I don't know if the car is becoming PC, but definitely the main you know, console, infotainment, the head unit, whatever you want to call it, definitely becomes more as you know looks like a pc you know connected open in, open operating system and all the same risks that, that you have on pc are becoming natural to the car as well so i'm going to get spammed and uh, what are you doing about spam and also uh, now all these apps are on there that are now monitoring me and monitoring everything and now how you dealing with the privacy issue of that and um, and then will I buy this or am I just going to turn it off? Yeah. Uh, maybe I, I, uh, I uh, comment just for the question before I can uh, continue. Is that I don't know whether the question is easy or not, but uh, what seems important is that the end user really trusts the fact that uh, their data are correctly protected and managed. So and I don't know really... Uh, how easy, uh, how difficult it could be. It really depends after on the, on the, on the different uh, applications and uh, and uh, and uh, openness about the, about the privacy. We see um, also uh, let's say part of the complexity that is uh, in uh, in the crypto part, let's say of the vehicle to uh, to vehicle communication, is the fact that uh, it is. Uh, uh, important and needed to to load many certificates so to have uh, the, the, the PKI and to guarantee the, the security be sure we can trust the messages but after that to be able to protect the privacy in some extent uh, it is important to 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 change the, the certificate very often and this is here part of the complexity but it is important because it is to uh, to 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 make a better um, system in terms of uh, protection of the of, of the privacy yeah yeah one question about crypto uh, because we talk about complex of designs and simplicity the nightmare of certificates and, and PKI i think that, that you're putting into the car seems to amaze me i haven't read all those standards but are you taking into account crypto so essentially as part of that design. What happens if one crypto algorithm happens to be next week declared absolutely weakness? Um, do we have to change also the crypto module from Gemalto? It's going to be solved only by software or is the industry taking these risks of dependency in, in today's crypto into account? 
Alors, yes, uh, especially because we are more and more talking about the quantum threat and uh, saying uh, that we saw uh, some development in the, in, uh, in the quantum processor. And uh, okay, so for the moment, there is no uh, impact on the cryptography we are using, but we see some developments. So uh, we know that uh, we have to be uh, prepared and be prepared means we have to, uh, to work on uh, what we call crypto agility be able to change the algorithm when the algorithm will be ready because for the moment we have only, uh, uh, let's say, some of them for the signature part, but with new constraints, maybe not very suitable for uh, the, the real-time constraint uh, you are uh, uh, facing in, uh, in, uh, in, the, in the, at least in vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle, uh, communication. So yes, we are working on that and we are working on how to be able to change the keys and the algorithms. And for that, for sure, it is really important to be able to, uh, to uh, remotely load software, keys and so on. But the uh, mechanism itself to be able to do this loading, uh, remote loading should be uh, uh, quantum safe if we want to face this, uh, this threat. So, um, so crypto agility is a topic in general and um, the quantum trust is only part of it. And we are uh, working on that, yes. In, uh, in an hour and a half, we've discussed a lot of issues related to cybersecurity. We haven't even touched the question of what happens when we take the person out of the car and the car is driving itself. Um, do we want to spend five minutes discussing that or do we want to leave that for another discussion? We'll leave that for, for the, we'll handle that in mid-May in Princeton. Or yeah. we'll leave it to the next generation when we have those cars. Yeah, yeah. okay. Um, any, any last questions before we break for lunch? You, do, yeah. Questions. Yes. Thank you. My name is Dr. Madeleine Shep. I'm a president of a non-governmental organization. Are you hearing me? Yes. Okay. Speak a little bit louder. Yes. Okay. Uh, I just want to know in your process if uh, you make some employment of women in the digital uh, view how to strengthen women and how to okay. how to make uh, to develop the capacity building in African countries. I'm not sure I understand the question. Is there the question is that I appreciate what you are doing, but I want to know if you have some resources, women resources, to help another woman in the domain to more understand what is going on, because what you are using, as the previous uh, speaker said, we, we want to know if our data are protected or not, and how to expand that to another people. Okay, and so this is, but this is specifically- For women. For women. Uh -huh. Yeah, I don't know. Anyone, can anyone answer the question? Is there for specific work being done for communicating the specific requirements of women within the cybersecurity domain. We have one woman on the panel. Uh, I can call my wife, but yeah. no, uh, no, thank you. I, I'm not aware of specific actions for that, but I think the, the, the problem is for the problem. The question is more general. This is not specific to women. I think the awareness about the cybersecurity and the way we are doing security in general is uh, really uh, changing, evolving, and I think uh, uh, it's not only a question of women. It's uh, a question of uh, we have to 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 discuss with men and women the topic. And uh, yes, it's better if we can discuss with women also. But uh, I think uh, yes, uh, the the question um, about the awareness of how cybersecurity is evolving is uh, is for all of us. Okay, but Mike, so, there are things done, and if you go on to uh, Wireless Car on LinkedIn today. Uh, or tomorrow, actually. Tomorrow is the International Women's Day. Today. So we, it's, uh, no, tomorrow. tomorrow, yeah. Thanks, okay. I should know that. And uh, we actually post all the women's working in wireless car, and we too few. We gather them, take a big picture, and then we, you know, 
advertise it, come and work for us, more women in the industry. We, and that, that is a small thing, but uh, the balance is important because we have different uh, views and different perspectives. And we need every perspective into this extremely big question. Shai. I don't consider myself as an expert in this area, but I can say that in our company, I think every third employee is a uh, woman. Uh, some of them are even in a managerial position. So what I see uh, inside our company with customer, for sure there is a room, room for women to take part. Some of them uh, uh, are even in uh, more senior positions uh, in the Israel uh, ecosystem uh, because of the compulsory military service. This brings a lot of sharp women into the into the industry. So I don't see any any barrier in that respect. And maybe the reason we see too many uh, uh, men and too little women is because of the tradition. But this may change in in few years. Yeah. Any? There is a question here. Yes, of course. Thank you. I think uh, one of your colleagues has touched this uh, topic. If you don't mind, we go back to the security. Uh, we have heard a lot about the quantum computers, and we know that they are very, with, uh, in fact, one of the companies, IBM, has launched its first commercially product a couple of weeks ago. And we know by having these quantum computers, they are, our current uh, security mechanism are not safe anymore. So. One, in order to protect yourself, there are there are different solutions. One of them is a quantum safe uh, uh, solutions that we have, like using the, for instance, quantum random number generator to to making a better keys or uh, quantum key distribution to 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 save secure the the, the backend, and also any other uh, quantum uh, post algorithm. Do you think this is something that we have to, to start thinking about it now? Or are you, have you already started? Or, or do you think this is something that that's, we, should, we should touch very soon? Thank you. So, so maybe, uh, yes, one point, we, we know, uh, uh, yes, with the state of the art on quantum cryptanalysis, so we know the algorithms that maybe will be implemented one day on a quantum uh, processor. And we know, for example, that uh, uh, part of the cryptography is not really impacted by that. So typically, all the system builds on symmetric key cryptography with a... Uh, uh, appropriate size for the secret key is not impacted by that. So uh, it, just to, to be sure that uh, everyone is understanding that uh, all the cryptography is not uh, 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 fallen uh, just with the quantum cryptanalysis. After, we already have some solution, as I said, for signature. And we know, uh, based on the state of the art, huh, we know, uh, I mean, regarding uh, conventional cryptanalysis, the so conventional attack uh, using uh, classical computing, and also quantum cryptanalysis. So the, we we have we are aware, based on the state of the art, of some algorithms that could be implemented one day if we have a sufficiently uh, powerful quantum uh, uh, computer. But this is not the case for the moment. And the sizes of the quantum computer we, we see for the moment are uh, really uh, too small. Uh, to, uh, to, to sustain uh, the, the cryptography. And more than that, we have very, very few uh, public information about experimentations on this quantum cryptanalysis, sorry, on very small uh, keys. So, uh, yes, just to, to know uh, everything is not completely uh, uh, broken and we don't know when it will be uh, the case. But yes, I think uh, it's already uh, possible to take that into account, especially using uh, what we mentioned, so the crypto agility. Uh, the mechanisms that will be uh, uh, useful in order to change uh, the crypto algorithms and the key in the future if we need it. We have the possibility to build on symmetric key cryptography. So this is also a possibility to, 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 voilà, to manage uh, uh, this risk. And uh, voilà, after we know we have to wait for the, the NIST process on, uh, on standardization on quantum safe crypto. We have also another recommendation, uh, both in Europe and also in the US, which is when we, you can do that, so maybe for uh, confidentiality of data, uh, use... Um, hybrid mechanisms that combine the mechanism we are using today and also 
some uh, post quantum mechanisms that that we have. So we have some uh, already some recommendations in Europe uh, and uh, and uh, in in the US, and we have some uh, possibilities to uh, to take into account this threat uh, in some extent and. Again, depending on the on the <laughs> general risk assessment, uh, because I think what is important is not to focus on one specific point, but really have the, have, have the, um, the, the, the the big picture, the overview of what is really the security of the system in the end. Thank you, Elaine. So Elena said the last word. Thank you very much. Um, I know I, I could sit here longer. Uh, unfortunately, lunch is waiting, so I think folks would like to uh, to take part in that. Thank you very much for the preparation, for participation, and for what I hope you all believe was a was a good discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you.